launch of Apollo 10 occurred at 11.49 Eastern Standard Time on May 18, 1969. This was a dress rehearsal and prelude to the big event of the landing of Apollo 11. The crew was Commander Tom Stanford. This was his third flight. Command module pilot John Young. This was his third space flight. He would go on to walk on the moon during Apollo 16 and fly the first space shuttle flight. Lunar module pilot Eugene Cernan. This was his second space flight. With a countdown now at T-minus uh, 5 minutes and 16 seconds and counting. Let me tell you very quickly what you're going to be seeing and what you can sort of look for on this liftoff. The ignition sequence, the engines fire up 9 seconds before the actual liftoff. The uh, hold down arms are thrown away and away they go. That's to build up power and up they go, 7.5 million pounds of thrust. A liftoff comes uh, at that point at zero. Then they kind of uh, yaw a little bit. They turn around and pitch over to start their course out over the Atlantic uh, Ocean from here. At uh, 1 minute and 21 seconds into the flight, they reach the maximum, max Q, it's called, the maximum dynamic pressure. And this is a critical point in the flight. Uh, at that point, if there are any structural weaknesses in this great rocket, they would probably show up. An aerodynamic load of 460,000 pounds on the vehicle. It's eight miles high at that point, four miles downrange. That's when you see the contrail begin right at that point. It's mo moving then at uh, some 1,786 miles an hour. Then in two minutes, 15 seconds into the flight, the inboard engines cut off, and just uh, 20 seconds later, the outboard engine of the uh, uh, s uh, 1C, the first stage of the rocket. It's then 40 miles high, 44 miles downrange at... Uh, then the separation of the first stage and the ignition of the second stage, two minutes and 43 seconds into the flight. And uh, we see the launch escape system. We've seen it jettison in the past at three minutes and 17 seconds. The second stage cuts off at seven minutes and 40 seconds. The vehicle then 111 miles downrange, or uh, high, and uh, 700 miles downrange, almost in its orbital height. And we have seen that far in the past uh, with uh, these remarkable long lens cameras here. Uh, we may not be able to see that today because of the cloud cover. The third stage then ignites at uh, nine minutes into the flight, and uh, they're well on their way into orbit, and shortly thereafter, uh, in the second orbit around the Earth, into the translunar flight. Jack King of uh, Launch Control here, who will be giving us the countdown from this moment. He is uh, giving that countdown now, and it is at just three minutes before launch. Let's listen to Jack King. This is Apollo Saturn launch control. We've just passed the three minute mark. We've had the firing command. That's the signal that the automatic sequence is now in. And the rest, the remainder of the count will be handled by the master computer here in the firing room as uh, various of events click off leading up to the ignition of the five engines in the first stage of the Saturn V at the zero, uh, with liftoff at the zero mark in the count. The actual ignition of those five engines will come at uh, 8.9 seconds in the count. We'll have a report of all engines running at the two-second mark. Uh, at that time, uh, and over the next two seconds, those engines will be uh, specially checked to assure that we have proper thrust. Once that occurs, we will get commit, meaning that the hold-down arms can release, and we will get liftoff of uh, the Saturn V launch vehicle atop seven and a half million pounds of thrust. We're now coming up toward the two minute mark in the count at this point, the tanks and the vehicle pressurizing. Two minutes and counting. Our status board indicates uh, here in the control room that all aspects uh, involved are uh, ready. Tom Stafford has just reported back uh, thank, uh, that they want to thank everybody for all the help. We're now at T minus one minute, 45 seconds and counting. We'll go on internal power with the launch vehicle at the 50-second mark. At 17 seconds in the count, the guidance system goes internal. This is guidance reference release. We already have the proper flight azimuth in. Now 90 seconds and counting. Now 90 That's and perfect. counting. The astronauts have turned off their ground communication at this time. However, they are on uh, VHF and, of course, the S-band circuits, as well as the special astronaut communication circuit. One minute, 12 seconds, and counting. The vehicle tanks beginning to pressurize at this time. Our status board indicates that the third stage tanks are now pressurized. We're coming up on the 60-second mark. 
60 seconds and counting. We are go for a mission to the moon at this time. The second stage tanks now pressurizing, and we're coming up on the power transfer. 50 seconds and counting. We have now switched to internal power satisfactorily on the batteries uh, of the first stage, the, all three stages of the Saturn V vehicle. 40 seconds and counting. Tom Stafford making a final check of his computer. The vehicle, uh, all uh, stages pressurized at this time. We're waiting for the swing arms to come back. One uh, should be coming back at this time, a second one at 17 seconds. Tom Stafford reports they are go. We're coming up in the 20-second mark. T-minus 20 seconds and counting. 17 seconds and counting. Guidance internal. 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9. We have ignition sequence start. Engines on. 5, 4, 3, 2. All engines running. Launch command. Liftoff. We have liftoff 49 minutes past the hour. The clock has started. The tower is clear. Tom Stafford acknowledges the roll and pitch program to put Apollo 10 on the proper course. Picture will break up a little bit because we are getting buffeted here now by the tremendous reverberations from that great engine. Shaking. Rockets disappeared into the clouds. Back out through that cloud layer. It looks like it's gold. It looks like everything is going very well. Looks like a beauty so far. And the pressure is relieving It's almost directly over what here. Mile. Miles high. Here now at Jack Riley, Mission Control in Houston. What a ride, man. What a ride. ride. Sounds like Stafford saying, What a nice ride. Gene uh, Cernan reporting, What a ride. Uh, Roger, going three minutes two. Roger. Okay. you through the max Q. You're looking good. One minute, 44 seconds, downrange, seven miles, 12 miles high. They successfully passed through my Q. Roger, copy, Tom. We're in communication from the space flight. Mode one, Charlie, you're looking great. You're here, no. Go for staging, 10. Hearing the voice of the command pilot, Tom Stafford. Right. And the voice of Mission Control in Houston. Inboard engines are out. Right, you copy, Tom. EDS all 10. Charlie Duke uh, asking the crew to turn off their emergency, de emergency detection system. That's staging you saw there. Roger. That was the uh, first Good stage. on the second stage. First stage blowing away from the rocket, leaving now just the second stage, right, third right, stage, and the rocket. Uh, 10 on the S2 is looking good. Uh, the... Confirm EDS off. Flight Dynamics reports trajectory go at 3 minutes 9 seconds, downrange 81 miles, 46 miles high. Second plane separation, that's the skirt around the engines on the second stage. And the launch escape tower has jettisoned. Man, that engine was quite a sequence. Right, sounded like it. And we have guidance initiated. We confirm that, 10. Sir, uh, Yes, it is looking beautiful, Tom. Everything's so pathetic. Uh, Roger. Listen, that beautiful communication from that command module. Charlie Duke talking to Tom Stafford. Yeah, I bet. Just like old Tom, it's beautiful out there. You guys sound ecstatic. Man, this is the greatest, Charlie. Charlie, baby. 
Fantastic, babe, really. That's Gene's surname with Fantastic. Uh, you're a go, trajectory and guidance look good. Yeah, Roger, we look right on the line on. Hundred and seventy one miles downrange, sixty seven miles high at four minutes fifteen seconds. Still go. Rather hate to come in here because we hate to miss any of the words from the spacecraft. Those men are pretty busy up there checking out all their systems right now, but uh, you heard how ecstatic they are about the flight. Some of the best communication we've ever had on the phone. Status check, everyone says go. The voices you're hearing are of the astronauts, mostly from Staffy. 50 seconds, 230 miles downrange, 76 miles high. That voice is out of Jack Riley, the mission control communicator who uh, talks to us. Jim Houston, at five minutes, you're all go. All your systems are looking great. Hey, Roger, five minutes, ten is go. All right, you're right on the track. Hey, Roger, Charlie. The, uh, that was Stafford and the Capcom. That we is have an estimate of uh, inboard engine cutoff in the second stage at 8 minutes 15 seconds. Outboard engine cutoff 9 minutes 11 seconds. And we're now 5 minutes and 30 seconds into the flight. The capsule communicator who is five talking from the seconds, mission control to the man in the spacecraft. Miles down range, 83 miles, miles high. Is astronaut Charles Duke. 33-year-old Air Force major. He's a member of the Apollo All 10 ground support crew. Go. He's been an astronaut for three years. So you're hearing the voice of astronaut Duke and of uh, Stafford, sometimes Cernan in there, uh, the voice reporting uh, the position of the spacecraft for us of the news media and you at home is Jack Riley. 50 miles downrange, 87 miles high now. First, get up, get up, get up, get up, get up, get up, get up. The next event is the outboard engines okay, of these five. Looking real good at six minutes, 23 seconds. Nah, thanks, Snoopy. Still there with you. Uh, you're looking good, which you're getting ready to go to your gimbal motors on, and your trim looks good. That's just tracking. Just beautiful. Still climbing at this point. Stan Houston Mark, S4B to orbit capability. Apollo 10 now has the capability to get into orbit on the S4B should the second stage uh, malfunction. On seven minutes, you're all go. We have nominal uh, level sense arm 8 plus 1, 5, S2 cutoff 9 plus 1, 1. Right. S4B is the third stage, one of these J2 engines. 225,000 pounds of thrust. Seven minutes, 14 seconds. Downrange now 538 miles and 94 and a half nautical miles high. Coming up on inboard engine cutoff. Should come in about 10 seconds. Right, looking good here. Right on the inboard, Tom. We confirm it. How's the ride? That's the one engine in the center of the five engine cluster that is now cut off. You got four other engines. Ten minutes and eight minutes. Uh, you're looking good. How's the ride? Yes, you're fantastic, Joe. Fantastic. Right. Next uh, operation is at uh, about another 45 seconds when the outboard engines Get cut off. Mark, level sense arm. The level sense arm. And We're right down the ground track at 8 minutes 30 seconds, 755 miles downrange, 98 miles high. After those outboard engines cut off, the second stage is jettisoned. And then the third stage and the Velocity payload. Velocity is 21,499 feet per second. Going to uh, 
orbit. That speed right, carrier. You're taking a status for staging now. Translates at about 13,000 miles an hour. Roger, Paula King, you're a go for staging. Staging is the separation of the Mark, mode stage. Mode 4, Paula 10, mode 4. Mode 4. Roger. Roger. Stafford confirming the separation the that you saw in the animation. Has initiated on the S4B stage, the third stage. Charlie, lots of stuff out the window at stage, and we're catching up and passing it now. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Looks very right on for the onboard plot, Charlie. Right. We confirm that. Looking great here. You're looking beautiful. That was a critical point, the ignition of the third stage engine, one J2 engine, 225,000 pounds of thrust. It's a reignitable engine. Seven miles downrange, 102 miles high, and the velocity is 23,400 feet per second. That's about 16,000 miles per hour they're going now. 16,000 miles cut off for the Sat Saturn uh, S4B stage, 11 minutes, 47 seconds. S4B cut off, uh, 11 plus 47. 11 plus 47. There, as you see there, uh, out over the Atlantic, they passed the Bermuda tracking station. They'll be picked up Down by the Canary Islands. Down range 12 miles now at 10 minutes, 44 seconds, 102 and a half miles high, the velocity 24,280 feet per second. It's about 16,500 miles an hour. They get up to 17,400 miles an hour for their Earth orbital yeah, speed. Roger, Chan, now you're Chan, you send it 1110, you're looking good. Uh, as we say, the guidance is beautiful. Right. This is the third space trip for Stafford and for Young, the second space trip for Cerner. Predicted cutoff now 11 minutes, 45 seconds. Cut off to the third Seco. stage engine. Roger, Seco. Six. Roger. Stand by, Stan. Cut off of the engine. The main engine. Okay, uh, Houston, we show 102.6 by 101.1. Roger, one, we copy that. That's his orbital altitude. Our, uh, was 25, 565, minus 110 feet stop, and the 102.6. Right, we copy. Assertion. And Charlie, have them uh, take a look at our uh, evaporator. We're reading a high outlet temperature and uh, we're all scale low on the steam pressure right now. Right, we agree. Stand by. A reading from there. Okay. Instruments, which uh, might indicate some minor problem. High evaporator temperature. I don't know just what the significance of that would be uh, on the outlet of the evaporator would indicate that perhaps building up temperatures within the end. Uh, saved, uh, we'd like you to on the evaporator. We'd like you to close the primary back pressure valve and activate the secondary loop. Roger, right, understand. Close the primary uh, back pressure valve and activate the secondary loop. Right, just for a little while. We'll give you the numbers. And we'll have uh, Vanguard uh, LOS at 1532 in a minute gap, and we see over the Canaries at 1629. Uh, Roger, and we have closed the isolation valve on CMRCS ring one. Two is still open. Roger. They're talking there of a communications gap. Uh, they lose uh, contact uh, as they pass between the uh, Bermuda and the Canary Island yeah, tracking station. The Saturn's in great shape. You're configured for orbit. Uh, we're all go. Uh, Roger, just looks beautiful. That was the capsule communicator, Charles Duke, saying and it looks... And, uh, Houston, we confirm your orbit. The IU vector has you in a 103 by 100. Roger. 
talking about the orbital altitudes in statute miles that actually would come to around 115 miles uh, of, uh, in statute miles rather than nautical miles. And it's right on the target, perhaps just a little bit high, but uh, not enough to cause any concern. The capsule communicator again, who said, uh, go, everything looks good, was Charles Duke, and you heard Stafford say it was beautiful so far. They lose contact here for about a minute uh, until they come up over the Canary Island station on the far side of the Atlantic and their first pass around the Earth of the two that they will make before they go on the way toward the moon. It'll take them about uh, uh, 88 minutes to make their first orbit of the Earth. They'll be back over the Cape area here, in other words, 88 minutes after launch, which now was just 15 minutes ago. Uh, everything going well. They've got a little trouble with that evaporator, as you heard. Uh, Houston, we want you to keep the uh, primary back pressure valve closed for about 15 minutes, and, uh, and then we'll uh, deactivate the standby. You got a beautiful example here of the combination, uh, the teamwork that is involved in one of these space flights. Every one of the systems, every one of the functions aboard that spacecraft, some 3,800 of them are monitored. Houston at uh, GET of 30, uh, we'd like you to uh, put the primary back pressure valve back in auto and uh, deactivate the secondary loop. Gene Cernan, uh, we heard from him right at the first part of the launch, and now we hear from him again. He's the lunar module pilot, but he's also the engineer monitoring all the systems aboard the spacecraft, and uh, he's taking over that function. But this is giving you an idea of the We've teamwork. We've had LOS at the Vanguard. be about a minute gap between uh, Vanguard and the Canary Islands station, showing a liftoff time of 12.49 zero zero point seven zero eastern daylight time seven seconds late isn't that terrible almost on precise moment seven tenths of a second no that's i should think Werner von braun would be ashamed of himself seven tenths of a second late getting this great beast and all that it had to do with it uh, off on call time control we should be picking up the canaries any time now we'll continue to stand by the, uh, talking about teamwork. We uh, do have AOS acquisition of signal at Canaries. Now. Every part of this uh, machine is monitored in the readouts of by computers and by telemetry uh, from the spacecraft and the engineers sitting there at their consoles in Houston uh, can almost fly that spacecraft themselves. Roger, copy. With all their readouts, they can analyze a problem. And, uh, uh, Ten, uh, Houston, would you like for me to uh, review this uh, Ring 2 uh, heater check? I want you to do that. Hold things down in the other rooms. Okay, uh, Tom, uh, we'd like for you to, uh, uh, we've got a seven-step procedure here, and I'll read it up to you. So, uh, panel 8, uh, CB, uh, CM heaters, uh, 2 main B closed, CM RCS logic on. CM RCS heaters on. I want you to heat ring two for 15 minutes. And you can select position C5 on the systems test and monitor the ox uh, line temp. Well, now they're getting a little bit technical uh, for us. And that sort of uh, technical talk will go on throughout this orbit. Uh, there are tracking stations. You heard them mention the Vanguard. It's a tracking ship out in the middle of the Atlantic to bridge that gap between uh, Bermuda and the Canary Islands. And they got some communication through that. Uh, but now it is the monitoring of all the functions. That's the purpose of these two orbits around the Earth. Be sure that everything is functioning in the spacecraft. They'll be reading out a whole set of figures which will be absolutely meaningless to us uh, laymen and uh, getting reading back from the ground, confirming these figures, confirming that all instruments and all systems are working. Let's take another look at that magnificent launch, but this time on slow motion video today. Sort of an instant replay. Now, here for the first time, we discovered a little problem uh, from where we sit 
And that's that, uh, that great cloud of uh, dust and smoke that comes up uh, with the wind in the southeast as we were getting it uh, blocked off our view there for the climb past the uh, umbilical towers, the tower that carries all the life support system uh, into the spacecraft while it stands on the ground. This is a picture from that tower, which is uh, only about 60 feet away, uh, showing the, the, the rocket as it went by at the 320-foot level. And there the skirt of the Saturn 1C stage. And that, oh, not quite. I, I was mistaken. I thought we were at the, at the base of the spacecraft, uh, the rocket. We were not at that point. You still saw that USA go by and the uh, venting liquid oxygen. And this is seen from the base. This is one of the NASA cameras, which are right there and are protected against the blast and heat of the liftoff. Honestly, I can't be sure that I can tell you what you're seeing right there. I can't make it out myself. It looks like the base of the rocket at liftoff, at, at, at ignition, uh, which it very well could be. We could have that scene out of sequence. There are the water jets at the pad, I'm told. Uh, they deluge this pad with over a million gallons of water pour across there in a very few minutes. Great jets of water uh, to dampen, of course, uh, the extreme heat from the launch and to put out any small fires that may have started on this uh, great dome of reinforced concrete, which is the launch pad. And there's a beautiful picture on that pillar of flame of that kerosene fuel with the liquid oxygen as the uh, furnishing the oxidizer. Seven and a half million pounds of thrust. Gulping thousands upon thousands of gallons of, uh, of uh, fuel every second. So makes that first 11 seconds which the seven and a half million pound thrust first stage operates. And so, the astronauts of Apollo 10 are well on their way for man's second voyage to the moon. They are just reaching their orbital height and their first orbit of the Earth, and in another three hours they will be, well, it'll be less than that now, two hours they'll be firing up for the uh, launch into uh, escape from Earth and their trip to the moon, which they will reach on Wednesday. CBS News color coverage of the flight of Apollo 10 will continue in a moment. This is a CBS News special report, the flight of Apollo 10, brought to you by Western Electric. Manufacturing and Supply Unit of the Bell System as part of our continuing coverage of important news events. Reporting from CBS News Apollo Headquarters, Kennedy Space Center, Correspondent Walter Cronkite. Good afternoon from the Kennedy Space Center. Well, man's second voyage to the moon is well underway. A beautiful launch from here at 12.49 at noon, at Eastern Daylight Time. That was uh, just uh, two and a half hours ago. And now the uh, uh, Apollo command ship is on its second orbit of the Earth. It's over Australia. And in a very short while from now, it should be firing to go into translunar trajectory. Get on the way to the moon itself. It's making these two orbits of the Earth to check out all of the command systems aboard the ship. And they all so far have been reported in good shape with one minor exception. There is a faulty auxiliary cooling unit in the command ship, but uh, that is no constraint against going into the lunar orbit, it is believed. And very shortly, the go will be given, and uh, they will fire off the third stage of the Saturn rocket, to which they are still attached. It will 
fire off with 225,000 pounds of thrust and push them up to a speed of almost 25,000 miles an hour, which is adequate to escape the Earth's gravitational pull, put them into an, a flight that would take them close enough to the moon to be captured by the moon's gravitational pull. And then they'll go into orbit around the moon, and that will come on Wednesday. The orbital velocity right now is 17,158 miles an hour, we have been told. They're in an orbit 123 uh, miles by 109 statute miles. And that ignition of the engine for translunar injection will come at 322, which is uh, just five minutes from now. They will add 7,117 miles per hour to their velocity and achieve then a velocity of 24,275 miles per hour. It's quite a, a jolt they'll be getting from that uh, engine when they do go into translunar trajectory. They'll speed up uh, uh, by almost uh, 10,000 feet per second and uh, they will finally, and that burn will go for five minutes and 43 seconds. So it really is uh, quite a, quite a uh, acceleration uh, as they begin the translunar in, uh, trajectory. The flight has gone uh, exceedingly well, as we say. The launch went exactly on time this morning at 12.49, and it was a beautiful launch uh, for those of you who were with us and saw it. They, uh, the, no problems at all with the Astronauts reporting that it was a fantastic sight. They were the most excited astronauts we've had in a long time, although it's the most experienced crew we've ever put up. Tom Stafford has had two flights in the Gemini, and uh, John Young has had two flights in Gemini, and Cernan, Eugene Cernan had one flight in Gemini. Uh, but uh, even so, their enthusiasm was clear. As they said, it was fantastic, just fantastic, a great ride. Oh, boy, should you see that. Bill Stout and Leo Krupp, test engineer at North American Rockwell in Downey, California, can tell us what's going to happen as they fire off this uh, third stage engine and go into translunar uh, trajectory. Gentlemen? Walter, Leo was just telling me that even though they're hurtling through space and have been weightless for a time, that firing you talk about is going to make quite a change in the feeling inside the cabin. What will it be like, Leo? Well, Bill, for the last two and a half hours, the crew has been in a weightless or zero-g condition and as soon as they ignite the S-4B, or the S-4B is ignited by the ground signal, they will experience an acceleration, which will be just like you're sitting in your chair right now, about a 1G acceleration. So they, for five minutes and 22 seconds while the S-4B is firing, they will be back in almost an Earth environment again in, in the cabin. As soon as the thrust is terminated, however, they'll go right back into the zero-G or the weightless condition. And uh, they will be in this condition then for the rest of the trip to the moon, except for the short periods when they may be firing their thrusters for mid-course corrections. But in effect, it's a return to that feeling of gravity, almost a return to Earth for a moment there. Mm -hmm. For about five minutes and 22 seconds, they'll be back to approximately a 1G uh, condition. Now, as soon as the, as soon as the burn is completed, uh, Tom Stafford is going to swap se seats with John Young. John Young right now is in the center couch and uh, Tom Stafford is in the left couch. And he'll do almost all the flying from here on in this mission, right? That's right. Walter? Right after the translunar injection then, uh, that coming at uh, 3.22, two minutes from now, we will then have the transposition and docking, the command module separating from the rest of the booster uh, and turning around and getting the lunar module there in the nose of the third stage, pulling it out, and then they're on the way to the moon alone. CBS News color coverage of the flight of Apollo 10 will continue in a moment. That transposition takes place at 3.48. Uh, this afternoon, and at that time, too, it is expected that Tom Stafford will turn on the color television camera for our first color television from space, a look at that exciting transposition and docking, the first critical maneuver of the mission since they've been in Earth orbit, and uh, perhaps we'll get a look back at Earth from up around 10,000 miles up. It should be pretty exciting. Transposition docking should be taking place just about now. Let's listen to Mission Control in Houston as they report what's going on out there in space. Booster engineer says the Saturn is go. Right on time. Roger, copy. Start. 
Right on. Roger. Roger, right Brian. On. We're on the way. Uh, uh -huh. Roger, we confirm. That's it. The third stage fired. Now, if it keeps firing for five minutes, a little over. Dan, uh, Houston, you have four feet. Looks good. Boost that speed to twenty-four thousand two hundred and seventy-five miles per hour for a three-day trip to the moon. The second spaceship is on the way to the moon. Twenty-six thousand four hundred feet per second velocity now. Hello, Apollo 10, Houston. In one minute, you're looking great. Roger, one minute. Everything looks good on board. It's Tom Stafford. Cool, matter-of-fact voice from these skilled test pilots. Now undergoing the greatest test of their career. Roger. Velocity 27,500 feet per second. That's about three fourths of the velocity they need, or roughly 20,000 miles an hour. They need 24,275 miles an hour. They started out at 17,400. If the S-4B third stage shut down at this point, the spacecraft would continue into a high elliptical orbit around the Earth. Way to watch a sunrise. Right. That was Gene Cernan. Twenty-nine thousand feet per second. Who's up, Gene? Roger, copy, Tom. Tom Stafford reporting three quarters of 1G. 1G is Earth gravity. That is the weight of a body oh, on Earth. Uh, Houston coming up uh, three minutes. Uh, trajectory looks great. Three minutes, everything looks good, Charlie. Beautiful, beautiful communications. Houston, we got a predicted cutoff 2 plus 3 9 plus 1 0. 2 plus 3 9 plus 1 0. It should be emerging about now from the. From the dark side of the Earth, and then in their translunar trajectory, they will be in full sunlight the entire trip. That means that on the sunny side of the spacecraft, warm up to 280 degrees Fahrenheit. Feet per second velocity. On the shadow side of the, of the command ship, to minus 280 degrees, and so that they don't boil away. Altitude 123 miles. Mighty sand go, the S-4B is looking great. All right, you're just in that tent here, looks good on board. So they don't fry on one side and freeze on the other. They set up a circular motion of the spacecraft. One revolution uh, per hour so that it turns at about the rate of the minute hand of a clock. Keeps, one, uh, keeps the temperature balanced between the two sides. Say again? We're getting some small Understand the small, small yaw oscillations, 10? Look at these high-frequency vibrations. Oh, I saw. 
Yaw is a motion from side. Minutes, we still have to go, 10. Yaw is a motion from side to side. And if it were severe, it uh, could be quite critical. There's no, uh, no indication it is severe. It's a slight yaw motion. According to our calculations, the engine should have shut down now. Uh, Dan Houston in the blind uh, at cutoff up uh, telemetry IU to accept. Seco. Seco's engine cut off. We confirm the cut off. And so that third Roger stage copy. has done the job. They're on the way to the moon. Roger, minus point six on the Delta VC. That's beautiful. Yes, that's ready. And, uh, Charlie, we got an O2-4 high right in the middle of the burn here, which we can't account for. Stand by, uh, John. At this point, if anything went wrong, they can go out to the moon, circle the moon, and come back home without firing another rocket, except to position themselves for landing. They are now on a trajectory which will carry them within the moon's gravitational pull, with perhaps, with perhaps one or two mid-course corrections of a very small amount. Uh, we think that uh, cabin pressure regs uh, kicked in there for that O2 flow, uh, John. They just went out and the snow's starting to drop now, so it looks like we're in good shape. Okay, fine. You're beginning to fade out. Uh, we think we'll be losing you through the redstone here in a, uh, about 30 seconds. Hawaii at 2 plus 4 4. <laughs> Communications are still through the ground tracking stations for Earth orbital flight. Uh, they say they're going to lose communication. They will very briefly uh, while the spacecraft gets out behind all of the shadows of the Earth and then become, comes into direct contact with the huge 85-foot uh, high-gain antennas placed uh, equidistant three points around the Earth at uh, Madrid, Spain, at Goldstone, California and at Honeysuckle in Australia near Canberra. They will establish contact there uh, in time for that transposition and docking maneuver, which comes at 348. Transposition at 348, docking at 358, and our first color transmissions, we hope, at that time. This trouble they were talking about, uh, the yawing, we heard no more about that, so it apparently was not severe. An O2 flow uh, does not concern, uh, is probably concerned with environmental control system could be concerned with the radiators they had a little trouble with earlier. Don't know about that, but at any rate, they didn't seem too concerned about it. And nearly all of the uh, command uh, systems, uh, they have redundancy, as they say, a backup system, and as you heard, they're perfectly calm. There doesn't seem to be anything of constraint in the flight. As I was saying earlier, if anything did go wrong as far as propulsion systems go, however, they would go right on out to the moon. They'd be caught by the moon's gravity, thrown around, and then they'd have so much momentum, they'd come out of moon's gravity and back toward uh, the Earth again on a free trajectory for a re-entry. Uh, however, they expect, of course, to slow down enough to go into lunar orbit and then to do their lunar module exercises and come back finally on Saturday. That is, start back on Saturday. That, that's a 4B third stage is now, they finished with that, don't need it anymore. They'll be separating from it when this transition and docking is completed. CBS News color coverage of the flight of Apollo 10 will continue in a moment. forward and it's uh, really hardly 
the day uh, for rain on the parade uh, of the Apollo missions. This is the day that we get the Apollo 10 on the way of the dress rehearsal to take a look at the landing site for the July landing. And then while the schedule is lower than it was expected to be at one time, it does provide for uh, four or five more moon missions, perhaps. But that's the end of the space program uh, as far as uh, exploration of other planets go and more, until more funds come along and the pipeline is indeed drying up and there's going to be a delay before we can mount another lunar landing or a deep space probe what we move into next the next phase is uh, earth orbital machinery earth orbiting space stations and there is a plan to uh, do a lot of that in the 1970s but so far when the apollo program ends after four or five missions to the moon, that uh, will be the end of our uh, planetary exploration for a while. The Apollo 10 is on the way to the moon, as we have reported. Translunar injection has taken place, and now the transposition and docking. Transposition will be about 8,100 miles from our Earth here, and uh, the, by 10 minutes or later, by the time they do the docking, they'll be out 12,000 miles from Earth, such as the speed of uh, space travel. You might be interested in some of the speeds of uh, space travel. We've got a few of the uh, figures here that they are going to be undergoing. They go very fast, and for space travel, they go very slow in these moon missions. For instance, in the Earth orbit, uh, that's 17,000, roughly 400 miles an hour. I think it was 17,002 for their trip on this particular flight. But they get down at one point to just 2,120 miles an hour. That's because now, from here on out to the moon, the Earth's gravity is going to be slowing them down, pulling them back, trying to get them back to the good Earth. And, uh, of course, they, having built this magnificent machine, are determined to break loose from that gravity. They'll go on toward the moon, but by the time they're about 35,000 miles from the moon, they will have reached the slowest point of their flight, and they'll just be going 2,120 miles an hour. But at that point, 35,000 miles out from the moon, the lunar gravity begins to take over and pull them toward the, loon, uh, the moon. So as they arrive opposite the moon, or at the moon, they'll be going 50. 700 miles per hour. When they get around to the far side of the moon, they slow down to stay in moon orbit so that the moon doesn't throw them back toward Earth. They have to slow down to 3,720 miles an hour, which is the orbital speed around the moon. Now, 17,000-something is the orbital speed around Earth, 5,000-something, the orbital speed around, or 3,000-something, the orbital speed around the moon. The reason for that is orbital speed is determined by that speed necessary to create enough momentum to balance uh, the uh, pull of the body that you're orbiting against the speed that would take you away from that orbit, that pull of gravity. And that uh, gravity is determined by the mass of the, uh, of the sur surface of, of the body that you're orbiting. Well, the moon is a great deal smaller than the Earth, and its gravity is just one-sixth that of the Earth, so the speed is slower, 3,720 miles per hour to get around the moon. Then to get back out of the, Earth, the, the uh, lunar gravity pull and come back to Earth, they've got to speed up to 6,188 miles per hour, and they finally reach their highest speed. With the Earth pulling them back at an ever-increasing speed from the moon, they finally plunge into the Earth's atmosphere at 24,695 miles per hour. Quite a flight for human beings from this planet as they go out into space to another planet. The flight is going ahead uh, according to uh, the flight plan. Uh, we're a little ahead here uh, on our... Uh, we should be showing you what is taking place at this time. It is 12.51, is it not? And they are supposed to have begun the transposition at 12.49, but we haven't heard that from Mission Control as yet. Uh, our animation is showing what uh, should be taking place out there at this time. They should have separated in the command module. That should have occurred just two minutes ago. And as Leo Krupp told you out there at uh, Downey, California, a little while ago, they're moving to 50 feet away from the, uh, the spent uh, S4B third stage with its precious cargo of the lunar module still in the nose. It's in something, something called the SLAW.
spacecraft LEM adapter. It's a parking garage for that vehicle. We're not hearing anything from Houston at the moment. Don't know why such silence from mission control. We are showing you by our animation here what is scheduled according to the exact timeline of the flight plan, but we're not getting any word from Houston. This does not mean that Houston isn't getting any word from the spacecraft. It does mean that something, uh, something's keeping the uh, Houston communicator, Mac Riley, from reporting it to us. We may be having trouble on our own circuits here. We have uh, heard from the spacecraft that we have separation. It's been relayed to me here, but I have not heard the word from Houston itself. But the relay here is that we have separation. Just keep tuned in here. We're getting these intermittent reports. These uh, men in the spacecraft are pretty busy. They're not uh, talking it up at this point. This is a critical phase of the maneuver, of course. They're absolutely... Oh, is pitching around now, the guidance and control officer says. Pitching around, and then we'll come back in and dock with the lunar module. Altitude now, 3,580 nautical miles. Velocity is down to 25,401. That world is just incredible. There goes the panel, Charlie. Roger. How do you read it, Gene? Not clear. We don't have the S4B yet, but there goes the panel. Roger. Those are the panels. The world is incredible. Really moving? Holy, holy, I sure hope we can show it to you. I really do. That's Eugene Cernan, whose favorite word is fantastic. Okay, I got the S4B. Roger. Means he can see, he can see the S4B. And there goes another panel. Roger, all retrograde, we hope. That means they hope the panel are falling back of them and not uh, coming forward to where they are. I don't know what risk it is up here right now. Yeah. Those are the slaw panels that house the lunar module. They've been jettisoned. Charlie, I got the world on closed circuit here, so we're going to try and get high game. Roger, standing by. Got the world on closed circuit. We're going to get a picture of ourselves from 10,000 okay, miles Okay, babe, there's high gain. Uh, the TV is on. I should be uh, coming down to you, uh, and I'll have to adjust it as we come along into the S4B. Hey, it's beautiful, Gene. We got the uh, black and white now with a little time delay on the color. You can see that uh, that color in the middle of the picture there. That's mission control in Houston, looking at the television hey, we got screen. The S4B coming into the top. Thank you. A picture of ourselves from 10 to okay, miles babe, there's high gain. Uh, the is on. I should be uh, coming down to you. Uh, I'll have to adjust it as we come along into the S4B. Hey, it's beautiful, Gene. We got the uh, black and white now with a little time delay on the color. You can see that uh, that color in the middle of the picture there. That's mission control in Houston, looking at the television hey, we got screen. The S4B coming into the top. The sun's really shining on it. Okay, I'll try adjust it for you. Hey, we got the color now. There it is. There it is. There's the moon You're on in, in color. 
Uh, that is the earth in color. Hey, we got the color now. You're on the air, babe. Oh, that's beautiful. Look Have at that. Have you got that. the color? Yes, sir. It's uh, looking great. I'm sorry it's still a little bit. That's the best I can do with the bracket. Uh, no sweat. We got it right in the center of the screen, Gene. They, it looks like the sun's really bright on it. Uh, tremendously so. That's Eugene Cernan in the spacecraft, astronaut Charles Duke, the capsule communicator in the ground in Houston. The voices you hear also. The sun's got the S-4 bit. The limb uh, sort of blotted out. It's the bright. Isn't that something? Look at that. 10,000 miles, and there we are. Zooming in, looks really good, Gene. Now, is that the Earth or is Charlie, that the... I got it closed down all the way. Is that uh, helping? Uh, uh, right in the, uh, in the center yeah, of the uh, limb, man, we still got a real couple of real bright, bright spots, uh, but it's looking real good in the color. We can see the uh, probe, uh, correction, the drogue. I'm afraid our excitement about seeing the Earth is a little bit premature. That's not the Earth at all. Over in that long distance, it looked like and even looked like you could even make out the North American and South American continents. That's how your imagination can run riot. This is the S-4B. Uh, Gene, it's really looking good. Uh, the, uh, it's the silver panels that are reflecting back uh, real brightly. They're awful house right now, too. Right, the, the resolution is fantastic. You're yeah. drifting off just to the right a little bit. We're looking right into the nose of the third stage of the Saturn rocket. And the lunar module is there in its garage, or the lunar adapter, and we see the nose of it. Now, Cernan told us a little while ago that he hoped he could see the Earth. Okay. This is a fascinating picture and has more scientific value uh, for Dan the... Uh, Houston, uh, you can't believe the picture we're getting. The resolution is really fantastic. I'll tell you, this monitor makes it great. More significance for the uh, space scientists and the engineers and technicians right at this moment. Uh, I'm sure that Cernan will give us that picture of Earth if he possibly can. They are out ahead of the... How's the color, Charlie? Say again? How's the color? Hey, it's uh, really beautiful, uh, Gene. Uh, you got it right, you got it framed just perfectly. Resolution. Okay, I think the color would be beautiful once we can show you the Earth. Right. That's a little 12-pound camera, 12-pound color camera, and the monitor is just three pounds, fits on the side of it. And it's just about a two and a quarter by a three and a quarter picture what they're looking at in their monitor. Now, they're out ahead of the uh, of that third stage. Oh, Snoopy sure looks good. Yeah. He sure do. Snoopy sure does. Snoopy is a lunar module. They're, they're calling uh, the lunar module Snoopy for this mission, and the command module will be circling alone over the moon. Oh, Charlie Brown's a Charlie Brown. cord and wire floating around here, though. <laughs> I can imagine. The Earth it would be in the background there somewhere, not obviously on the picture, but they're out ahead of the third stage and looking back at it with Earth beyond it somewhere in the background. The moon is to their backs. Closing rate you see is the closing rate we've got. Roger, we copy. 
Uh, Genius, it looks like you, we have a bright spot, uh, maybe on your Viticon, coming in on your Viticon tube on the black and white. It's right above the, uh, the, the drogue. Now, uh, we've got it in real life. The, uh, I'm, the camera's fully in the shade. Uh, that's just a reflection coming right off the, uh, right off of Snoopy. Right. Uh, Ten, uh, we, we're afraid you might be burning a, a hole in your Viticon tube. Uh, move it off uh, to the, a little bit off for Snoop. Uh, I think it's, those panels are so bright we might be getting problems with the Viticon tube. All right. If they've already got it, they've got a little bit of a bright spot you see that stays there. Even though they pan off, stays there right on your screen and ours in the center. Not too severe. I can just cover it up for a while if you'd like. Stand by. He's got his hand in front of the lens now. <laughs> It'd be pretty hard for our cameraman here to do. Her arms aren't long enough to go around the camera in the first place, and her hands aren't big enough to cover the lens. We have other things that get in the way of our pictures. Well, at least we had a great moment of excitement and, uh, there, Houston, thinking that like was the, the uh, uh, Snoopy back. If Still you looks it a little us. bit like it. I'd be glad to. Hey, that's looking great now, except for a couple of fingers there or something. Good resolution. That's what they were. You got your big hands in the way. Yeah. Hey, I don't know what you did, but the, uh, it's a really beautiful now. Really great. We're just a little closer. Yeah. Hey, the color is great, Gene. How's that for the front porch? Oh, boy, that's beautiful. Those are the steps leading down from the uh, lunar module. Those are the 10 steps, which were carried yeah, in to the moon too. surface I got to see on a future window. flight. Hey, what's that guy doing on the front porch? That's the green man, Griddle. Just think. Yeah, John estimates 50 feet close. Roger. These two ships are moving along 50 feet apart, 25,000 miles an hour, 10,000 miles from the Earth's surface. All I can say is it's really happening, and what hasn't happened, you haven't seen yet. Roger. Really great resolution. That was Gordon Cooper. He and Charlie Duke are both on the Capcom console. Gordon Cooper, one of the original Mercury astronauts. And that orange platform is the front porch. The front porch is a little area out of which the men in the lunar module will leave the lunar module, and then down those steps to the surface of the moon on the flight Apollo 11, which it will go in July if this flight continues to go as successfully as it has in these first three hours and 15 minutes. Four hours and 15 minutes now. Three hours and 15 minutes. My computer back. We've got a very small angle of uh, error possible there. I uh, can't. It's looking real stable to us. We show you closed and climbing. Roger. I should like 
parking a brand new limousine in the garage in which you've got about a quarter of an inch clearance on either side. I want to scrape those new fenders. They can't afford to scrape their fenders uh, in this mission. They're moving in there at less than at about a third of a mile an hour. They could go, oh, perhaps 15, 16 times that fast before they would uh, undergo serious damage in a too hard a meeting. But they can't be off the line very far as they insert that docking probe into the docking column. Roger. Houston, uh, you're looking good. We can see the uh, markings at a rendezvous with it. Looks like you just docked. Uh, Roger, we got a capture. You haven't fired yet. Roger. This is John Young, veteran of two previous Germany missions at the controls. We can read, read the uh, numbers on the lamb right, uh, docking window. <laughs> Those are gradations etched in the window of well, the lunar Mountain, module. We're there. Got two grades. Roger. You saw the docking, Charlie. We didn't get any master alarm. Everything looks snug. Roger. Didn't look like there was any, uh, hardly any, uh, uh, after doc, post docking of oscillation. Yep. They didn't bump scarcely at all, just slid together there. You can see the uh, docking window of the lunar module. It has there's a gradations on it to aid okay, in the line of its docking. Roger. You can see the, uh, look like uh, some of those panels still floating around there behind them, moving, of course, at 25,000 miles an hour, too. And those are the uh, thrusters of the action control system, those little, little bells there. Those are 100 pound thrusters. Yeah, that's a great picture of the quad. They're called I'll quads. I'll try to get a quick tour. We're, I may have to hold you up for a little bit here. Okay, John's going down to the LAB and I'm going to the left seat now. Roger, Tom. We're, we're standing by. They're changing seats again. Stafford's going over to the command seat and Young is going back to the center couch. Those little thrusters are called quads because they come in clusters of four each. We'd like you to save the logic. That was one of the reaction control system quads you saw there at the last. We're coming back up here now with another pick. Altitude 6,469 nautical miles. Velocity 21,280 feet per second. Space navigation is in nautical miles, feet per second, rather than statute miles and miles per hour. I suppose someday we'll all have to shift over to that and begin to think in those terms. We've been trying to translate into miles per hour and statute miles which is the miles we know on Earth, and miles per hour, the thing we measure speed in most of the time, our Earth-bound existences. Charlie, you're going to have to look at the same picture for a while until we get this uh, targeting check complete. Roger, we understand you're busy. Uh, 
Uh, Leo Krupp out in uh, Downey, California, uh, what are they doing at this moment? Uh, they understand they're busy, and I'm sure they are, but just what are they doing? Uh, well, Walter, John's down the lower equipment bay, and what he's doing is pressurizing the tunnel between the command module and the lunar module. He'll then remove the tunnel hatch, and he'll go up into the tunnel, verify that all 12 of the docking latches were automatically actuated, and they're all latched properly. He'll then take the umbilicals uh, from the lunar module and plug them into the tunnel wall so we have an electrical connection between the lunar module and the command module. He'll do those preparations, and then he'll come out and reinstall the, uh, the tunnel hatch again. This is the hardest physical work of the whole trip, isn't it, Leo? Uh, no, sir, this, uh, they will not remove the tunnel hardware at this time. All he'll, oh, do that's is right. all he'll do is take the hatch down so he can get access to the umbilicals and check the latches. Uh, they won't remove the tunnel hardware, the probe and drogue, until after they're in lunar orbit. That's, that's the tough one. Yes, sir. Then they really are doing uh, manual labor. It seems peculiar in a way, and it's a little hard to explain, except it's uh, involved in saving weight and uh, a lot of other gear, apparently. But with all of this highly complicated uh, equipment, computerized, transistorized, miniaturized, uh, and all of this uh, in the space capsule, when they get down to this business of uh, of uh, putting these two spacecraft together and taking that uh, docking, uh, that, that hatch uh, out from between them, suddenly man has to get up there and that's young job, he wrestles with it and pulls at it and tugs and yanks and finally moves it around and gets it back where he needs it so that they can open up the space between the command module and the lunar module for, in this case, Stafford and Cernan to... the latches. Uh, they won't remove the tunnel hardware, the probe and drogue, until after they're in lunar orbit. That's that's the tough one. Yes, sir. Then they really are doing uh, manual labor. It seems peculiar in a way, and it's a little hard to explain, except it's uh, involved in saving weight and uh, a lot of other gear, apparently. But with all of this highly complicated uh, equipment, computerized, transistorized, miniaturized, uh, and all of this uh, in the space capsule, when they get down to this business of, uh, of uh, putting these two spacecraft together and taking that uh, docking, uh, that, that hatch uh, out from between them, suddenly man has to get up there and that's young job, he wrestles with it and pulls at it and tugs and yanks and finally moves it around and gets it back where he needs it so that they can open up the space between the command module and the lunar module for, in this case, Stafford and Cernan to climb down into the lunar module and make their way uh, to within 10 miles of the moon's surface, which is the name of the game in Operation uh, uh, Dress Rehearsal, which is Apollo 10. The dress rehearsal to prepare the way for man to land on the moon in July. CBS News color coverage of the flight of Apollo 10 will continue in a moment. Four hundred and sixty-one individual, separate, distinct parts. They don't mean much to you yet. In fact, not until Western Electric puts them together. Precisely, efficiently. Then all 461 parts turn into a bell telephone. So that you can dial almost anywhere. To help you keep in touch, Western Electric backs up your Bell Telephone Company by making dependable phones and things that connect them. Does our name ring a bell? Yes, millions of them. I'm Walter Cronkite, back here at the Kennedy Space Center at our CBS News headquarters for the flight of Apollo 10, a flight which is going exceedingly well up to now. As you have seen those remarkable pictures from space, and you're seeing one now from that new Westinghouse color camera, uh, we have seen the transposition, that is the command module leaving the uh, S-4B third stage of the Saturn, turning around, docking with the lunar module. It will be uh, ejecting the lunar module, pulling it back out and letting the S-4B go on its way around the moon and out to the sun. 
uh, at uh, 4.58 p.m. That's uh, another 40 minutes from now, uh, just about that time. Uh, meanwhile, they ride there, hooked up with the S-4B, taking a good look at the lunar module in its uh, garage and getting set for that uh, ejection uh, move. We uh, uh, are still hoping that uh, Eugene Cernan, with that uh, camera, will pan off and give us a view of the Earth from out there 10,000 miles or more away, as they are now, moving along at almost 25,000 miles an hour. Uh, he uh, indicated he was going to try that uh, a little earlier, and uh, he may yet. Yeah. These fellows are giving us a lot more television than had actually been on the timeline and the schedule of the flight, as Tom Stafford had indicated he uh, might. Uh, the, each transmission scheduled for around 15 and 10, or 10 to 15 minutes, and now this one already has gone on for 25, and they're still showing pictures. These, uh, the crew of Apollo 10 have shown a great deal more interest in uh, television from out in space than the earlier crews, uh, which showed, seemed to be a little bit reluctant in spending time with television. They had only the black and white RCA cam with which to work, but uh, uh, there was that uh, reluctance, notably, uh, it seemed to be, uh, noticeably, it seemed to be in the earlier flights of Apollo 7 and 8 and 9. But Stafford has said all along that the view from space is too terrific not to share with the people who are footing the bill. And he plans to show the blue globe of the Earth, uh, marbled in white clouds. And uh, uh, as Apollo 10 soars uh, away from the Earth and toward the moon, and finally we'll see that gray uh, pitted disk that is the moon itself with that remarkable camera. Eugene Cernan said at one time, I've got a quote of his here, our feeling about this is that I could sit here and try to tell you what the color, uh, colors look like on sunrise and sunset, and you could attempt to picture them in your mind but until you've seen them, until you've been able to feel them with your own eyes, you can't transmit it to another person. With this color television, we hope it will be able to do something that I think all of us in the program have wanted to do for a long time, and that's share some of the experiences and the things that are happening. Thanks to my over-enthusiasm, we're getting two thrills about seeing the uh, Earth from uh, outer space. If you like this video, please press the subscribe button to subscribe to this channel, and also give it a thumbs up. You can also be notified when I post further videos on the anniversary of this flight and on the anniversary of the flight of Apollo 11 coming up in July. You can also support this channel with a donation by using the link in the description.